Hello, Hockey World. It's Monday, April 11th, 2016. I'm Michael Agello. I'm Dan Petru. I'm Russ Cohen from Sportsology. And I'm Eklund. You're watching Hockey Buzzcast on HockeyBuzz.com. And we just wanted to sort of start today with a little bit of thoughts for Ed Snyder and his family and the Flyers family and the hockey world in general because there's so many um, people all around hockey, not just, you know, either that played here or... Ed helped a lot of other owners out in different ways. Um, I could tell you that flat out that when owners were trying to figure out how to how to do it, he was always there. You know, he was, and um, it's very sad with the passing of Ed Snyder today. It's um, really emotional. It's a morning kind of like I was. I started the morning. I was. I worked yesterday really hard on this preview um, for the uh, for UFAs and everything like that. And I just, it's just like the kind of thing that just takes the wind out of your sails. You know, it's it's literally just like, whew. and you know, we know it was coming. We knew it was coming. From way back, I mean, you know, Russ and I, they've been talking about it in the press box for almost a year. Yeah. You know, and we've been hearing about it, and you weren't allowed to talk about it, you weren't allowed to write about it. Um, but, you know, and you knew it was coming, and, and it's just it's one of those kind of things, like, you know, like kind of like Gordie Howe in a way, you know, where, you know, Gordie Howe was really sick, and everybody thought he was going to pass away, but he fought back, and it, it, Ed Snyder had the same kind of fight in him, you know, you kind of thought, oh, yeah, he's just going to live, you know, he's just going to fight, yeah. he's going to beat it, and, you know, of course he didn't, and... I know a lot of people who are, you know, behind the scenes who are really sad today. People who worked with Ed before and um, and worked with him or worked with him now, um, and all over the NHL. So, like I said, so I wanted to just, but we're going to get into the we're going to get into the pre playoff previews. We're not going to have a completely sad show, and I'm not going to steal Russ's, you know, fire by being the guy who shares the stories of people passing away. <laughs> but, um, um, but this is this is a personal one for me. So I wanted to share a story quick. Um, a couple little quick stories from Ed Snyder. Um, and me, because he's been he's one of the reasons, I mean, beyond just the fact, I mean, my mom sent me a really cool text, you know, and, um, I mean, beyond just the fact of that, you know, I probably wouldn't be here today <laughs> if it wasn't for then. Um, he says, my mom, my mom just wrote, you know, so sorry, I hope he made, the, I hope, I hope he knew they made the playoffs and so sad for his family that he always loved the Flyers and, and uh, he didn't know they made the play in the playoffs, which is kind of a, kind of a cool thing and, Wait. So you're saying? Are you saying you're a Stanley Cup baby? Is that what you're you're saying? I'm kind of a Stanley Cup baby. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I I am I am like one. I'm two years younger than the Flyers. You know, two years younger than the or one. I guess one year younger than the Flyers technically. Um, and yeah, I, or 18 months. <laughs> you know, so I've the I've so Ed Snyder is 67. Started this team and you know as we all as you all know just did it with his own money and got a loan and. People saw him he couldn't do it, and he first started. He actually first bought the Eagles for a little bit, bought like a small part of the Eagles, and uh, but he um, his just his passion about this team, and there are so many incredible moments, and I'm sure there'll be incredible documentaries done on him. And there already are. I mean, if you watch the Broad Street Bullies documentary, it's basically an Ed Snyder documentary. You got to watch that one sometime. But my stories are this: um, the, when I first came into the Flyers press box after the first lockout where he lost the season. I was nervous because I hadn't, you know, been in that press box, you know, as this character of Eklund, you know, so I was really, I was really, I didn't know what, I didn't know what anybody would think of me or what, what anybody would, you know, and, you know, I, I met Ed Snyder right away, and <laughs> they kind of introduced me to him right away, and he said, so you're that blogger guy, huh? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, I don't know what blogger is, but I think you're the best, I hear you're the best at what you do. And I'm like, I don't know about that, but um, I appreciate it. And he said, well, you know, Gary and those guys said, I can trust you, so I can trust you, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you can trust me. He's like, all right, then, you're in. And uh, literally, from that day, which was 11 years ago now, the Flyers have treated me and everybody around Hockey Buzz like gold. I mean, I can't, it, it was it was as if, you know, once you were, once you were, once you were just, you know, approved by Mr. Snyder, you were approved, you know, you were in, and... I have never had a single problem with that with the Flyers organization, and I, you know, I can't say that about every organization in the NHL, but um, but with the Flyers, um, especially, it was, it was just amazing. I mean, you know, you see the other night Bill Meltzer giving out the award to Wayne Simmons on the ice. You know, Hockey Buzz has always been treated, you know, first rate, and that that's always meant a lot to me. And and, and you know, when he said that, and I know, you know, he and Gary were close, and I know that that's, you know, it's got to be a hard day for Gary. Um, and even even the owners that he didn't like, the owners he had to write checks to, you know, for um for revenue sharing, he would say, I know I got to do this, but I don't think we should have to do this, you know. And I, I would, you know, he just, but he said, I I know why we have to do it, and he he knew why the NHL had to grow, and 
And yeah, I do think he's why we have a trapezoid behind the goal. <laughs> I, do, I do think that might have been a trade-off at some point. Um, but uh, yeah, he because because of Marty Brodeur being in New Jersey. Um, I don't know if that's true. But um, and the last thing I'll share is this story. I got to spend an entire day with him once. Um, in that first year, I was doing things. I was covering the team a lot and um, meeting the players and you know getting to know some of the players better. And I was really lucky to. He invited my wife and I to sit and sit in his box for a game. And um, I was shy. I didn't know how to handle it. I was like, well, that's amazing. Sure. You know, having grown up as a Flyers fan, I'm going to sit and watch a game with Ed Snyder. How cool is that? So my wife and I, oh, and him, he and his wife were there. And at first they took us up to this um, really cool, they have like a pre-game meal up in the, if you walk, when you when you walk into the Wells Fargo Center, those of you know it, you see this, their store there, you know, the Wells, the big store. And above that you see like offices, right? Part of the Wells Fargo Center, their, their offices. Well, one of those is a really beautiful dining hall. One of those, because I remember I sat there and looked out. Yeah, it's really nice. I've been in it. Oh, you've been in it. Okay, so up there. So I've been up there. So that's where I was. That's where. I, and the whole time I was there, he was. He had a bunch. Of, you know, he would have a couple guests to every game. There was probably like ten of us. It was just like you would imagine, like a Mr. Burns, Montgomery Burns, at the end of a big long table. You know, and he was. It was just like that. And he was talking to us, and he said, "This guy here is going to change the hockey world with his writing." <laughs> I'm like, holy cow. He's like, this is a, he's a blogger. You guys know what a blogger is? And they're like, yeah, we don't, you know, we know what a blogger is. <laughs> he's like, he's a blogger. And he's, and, you know, and I, it just meant so much to me that, like, that in the company of some of these really, I can't even, <laughs> some of these really important people, he had, you know, he had the faith to say that about me. And then we went into, we went in to watch the game, and I sat, I sat directly behind him. And the two things that always stuck out were that, you know, we got there, there was a big thing of popcorn there and a phone. And that was it. And the phone was literally a red Phone, I think I remember this red phone, but it was a phone. It was it was a, it was like it was like the you know, Gotham City phone. You pick up the phone, you know, you pick up, and it was a direct link to Paul Holmgren, um, in the, the GM at the time in the press box, and he picked it up a dozen times during the game. Did you see that? Why can't we clear the puck on the power play? Boom, you know, has, we need to get a goalie who can handle the puck. Boom, you know, <laughs> um, and the popcorn like before the last drop, the last kernel was out of there. Somebody else had another thing. Boom, it was on there. And they knew uh, Mr. Snyder, you know, that was his thing. And he was, and his wife was watching the game and just, you know, she kept looking back at my wife and saying, oh, you know, this is, you know, this is, and I'm like, this is passion. This is, this is, this is, he's a Flyers fan. He's a, he's a sports fan. He's an owner of a team, but he's a sports fan, right? Yep. So we, we, the game goes through and the Flyers lost in overtime to Florida. I'll never forget this. And um, I think Nidamaki was in goal or something like that. And he was really unhappy with the goal. And, um, but so, so he says, follow me. So he says, you, and he points to my wife, you go with her. So my wife and his wife go off, and Ed and I start on our way to the elevator, you know, and I'm like, having been in the press, like, I know that we wait for the, we wait for the Snyders and all those people to go on the elevator before we go on the elevator downstairs. This is how it works. We sit out there, and, you know, this wrestler, like, you know, Hexy and all these guys will get onto the elevator, and at that time, there was like, and you know, they got onto the, they would always get onto the other elevator. We get on the big elevator. So we, I go down the elevator, and I've been in the pre, I've been in the locker room now for you know 20 or 30 games. So it is, I'm, you know, the players are used to seeing me. Well, Ed Snyder after every game would would shake hands with every player on the team. Wow. And what he so he said, follow me. So we walked in, you know, you know, no one, no one, no everyone just like boom got out of the way. Ed walks in, he's full speed, he's mad, he's re, he's really mad. He's, like, he's talking to me the whole way down. I can't believe we gave that goal. You know, what do you think we need to do? Do we need to get that? What do you, we need to get a goalie? Oh, we need that. And we walk through the door, and I walk into the locker room, and all the players are still sitting in their lockers, and now this is, the, the media is never in the locker room at this point. Whenever I get into the locker room, there's no one there, and they bring out the players one by one. This is where they've already, they've already, you know, taken their stuff off and all that stuff, but they're all taking their stuff off, and they're looking at me like, you're a reporter. What the hell are you doing here now? So now it's an uncomfortable moment with all the players, and Ed's like, and Ed says, follow me, and shake everyone's hand, so I go through, and he shakes, he's like, Tough game, guys. You'll get it next time. Tough game, guys. Good, good job on that. He had some little things for every player. You, you know, you're you're really getting good on the point in the power play. Shakes goes through, but da da da, and I'm I'm shaking hands and I'm like, because uh. <laughs> I'm like a media guy. This is not what I'm. You know, you're. This is like kind of I'm, I'm kind of like crossing some kind of weird fourth wall here. It's like in House of Cards where you're the writer who's with the president. Yeah, right. Exactly. And and things change from like I'm covering him to I am now part of this family for a time, you know, which to me was like covering him is cool. Being a part of this family is mind blowing, you know. So I'm like in this thing, I'm like, wow. So um then we and you know, afterwards he said, you know, great, I love your stuff. You know, as long as you're fair, I don't you can you can criticize the team, just be fair. If you have any questions, give me a call. And I did a couple times and uh, you know, and, and it was just uh it was really something. 
It was really something. And then when my appendix burst, I got a, I got a, I got a, immediately got like a little thing from the flyers, you know, when I was in the hospital, you saw my appendix burst. Like, you know, really sorry, get back on your feet. And this year has been a tough year for me because my son's been going through a lot of stuff and uh, I haven't been at the games too often and, you know, and yet, you know, the flyers just have, you know, and I've filled them in and they've always been like, don't even worry about it. Whenever you're ready, whenever whenever you can come, I'm like, I don't feel comfortable leaving my wife sometimes with my son because, you know, it's just, just she, she gets nervous and I just want to make sure I'm there in case something happens and they don't worry about it and the flyers have been incredible. So, I mean, this is just, there's a reason this organization is what it is, and I just wanted to kind of share that story. And um, thanks for listening. And I just, you know, it, it's good to talk about it. Yeah, I just have, I just have one quick thing. I mean, I've seen Ed Snyder do that on the road. By the way, even after a big loss with, yeah. with the players, so that's why the players always appreciate it. But I also, I, I had a chance. I guess it was a year or two ago to see this baseball exhibit in Philly at the American Jewish Heritage Museum, and and I got invited, and I was like, hey, this sounds like a cool thing. They're gonna have some Hank Greenberg stuff, you know. I'm a Jewish guy, so of course I'm going to want to cover it, right? And I go there, and one of the first things I saw was this wing that was donated by Ed Snyder. Yeah. And, it, you know, that stuff doesn't dawn on you until you sort of see it because it catches you by surprise. But like the Youth Foundation hockey, like all that's great stuff that not every owner does it. Now, a lot of owners do, and they, and they do it in anonymity too. And he didn't ever look for accolades for stuff yeah. like that, so I give him a lot of credit. No, and that was a – that his religion and his faith was a big thing to him too, and he, he always played it down and in the – yeah. yeah, and I can never. I mean, he. I, I married a Jewish woman, and I remember him when he met my wife. He's like, "You look like you." <laughs> I'm like, I'm "Like, yep, 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 indeed." So, uh, and Gary Batman's always been funny about that too. But um, and they're they're you know they really are just classy. He's just such a, he was such a classy guy, you know, and and that classiness has come through the Flyers organization. Yeah, you know, well, to other people. Go ahead, Mike. The thing I res the thing I respect, and you know, being a Yankees fan, I always appreciated that there were some people who hated George Steinbrenner because he was a bit he was a big mouth, or you know, he would meddle. But he he had a passion for the game. He loved his team, and he wanted to see his team win. And I think Ed Ed Snyder was the same way. And I remember 1999 when the Leafs beat Philadelphia in the playoffs. It was Game mm -hmm. Six. They won one nothing on a Sergei Berezin goal. And I remember Ed Snyder coming out after the game and excoriating the referee, basically saying it was a gosh darn terrible call. Well, remember, it was a bad call on John LeClaire, or at least that's what it appeared like at the time. And, and and he was like, I don't care if I get fined. This was, you know, this was bull crap. You know, he was, you know, he owned the team. He's a billionaire, but he was still a fan. He was he was involved. Yeah. And you, you know, you saw Steinbrenner standing in the in the stands watching the Yankees play Kansas City or play in a World Series against the Dodgers, and he was into it like a fan. And I have a respect for, you know, owners who just don't own the team for the sake of owning the team. It was a passion for them. It was something that meant something to them, and I have a lot of respect for that, and I offer my condolences to the Snyder yeah. family. I mean, the one thing I'll say is about that about that particular game is there's a great story behind that. Because at the time, um, Keith Jones shared it today on, on WIP, the local radio station as I was driving around. Because Keith and Al Morgani, they you know, and everybody knows Keith Jones from from NBC, but he he's you know he does the morning show here in Philadelphia too, and he was on the ice when that he's on the ice when that happened when that when that play happened when Leclerc takes that penalty, um, and he was and you know he, he and as I came in as I ran right up to Keith Keith Jones in the locker room he says I don't care how much you get fined you say whatever the hell you want to say to them right now and I will pay that fine, <laughs> and Keith said. So Keith said, "I just went nuts. I said all kinds of crap about. He said, I just, I just went off on him, and um, and the, you know, the, I got fined two thousand dollars. And sure enough, Ed, Ed Snyder came in when the fine was there. He grabbed the, grabbed it, wrote him a check. Here's your, here's the fine. He's like, you got off easy. I got fined fifty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that, that, I mean, what owner would, what owner does that? You know, that to me, that it's just such a. This was he, what was he was about? You know, he just didn't." And and the stuff he's done for the inner city with with the Ed Snyder youth hockey thing is just incredible. I mean, it's off the charts. And I think you know, and Wayne Simmons has been a big part of that too, and has helped. And you know, those guys were really close. And a lot of the emotion you're seeing from Wayne Simmons right now is, is because of this, because you know he he really he's come out and said they're winning this for Ed Snyder, and um, you know he just means the world to him. And I know they I know Voracek and Hexy said some words today, and I know Wayne couldn't. I mean, it, it, there's just really. This is because because it's just too emotional. Um, what Ed did for that, I mean, you know, doing that stuff, just he just really he just really cares about people, and 
And uh, you know, it's I mean, here's a guy who built an arena without without money. You know, like the new the new arena he built on his own, very little very little no, funding. Very little government funding, you know, like, and where we see, you know, most people, most owners now are threatening to leave if they don't, you know, get government funding for their buildings. Ed, Ed built it with like I think ninety percent of his own money, you know, um, and that, you know, and just that's 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 because that's what he thought was the right thing to do. It, it's just, and he probably he could he could have held up the flyers for that money. He could have held up the city for that money. I mean, this city, the, I'm not the flyers, but the city and the city would have paid it. You know, they had Ed Rendell, who was the mayor of the Philadelphia, he was on the radio today too, talking about that, and just said. Yeah, you know, um, he said the only one of the only times I helped him out was uh, Ed came to him and said, you know, I'm putting in I'm putting in my half of six million dollars to build all these rinks for this Ed Snyder youth hockey program, but they're all being built in the center city. They're all being built, so I need some I need some something for you guys too, and and uh, you know just like helping this he helped with land and helped with different things that the city owned, and and you know Ed's like how could I say no to him? He was uh, he was uh, I couldn't it was everybody wants something from you when you're a mayor, but you couldn't say no to Ed Snyder the way he came across. He's like we got to do this, and that's what they did. So, yeah, tough day. Um, but you know, and and really, really happy that he got to see the Flyers make the playoffs. Um, that he was that he and he was coherent about it too. And um, you know, Lauren Hart, who uh, FaceTimed him after she sang "God Bless America" during that whole "God Bless America" thing this weekend. Lauren is best friends with um, Ed's daughter, so it's like it's really it's all that's how the whole family where it's how the whole Flyers thing works. It's just it's so entwined, and I know a lot of teams have this. It's just kind of a pleasure to be able to see it from the inside and to realize that you know a lot of people who are there have been there a long time. Like um, like Zach Hill, who's the media director, is the best in the country. I mean, the best in the NHL. Every year when they go, when they when they ask they ask journalists who are the who's the best team to deal with, it's always the Flyers. Zach is phenomenal. You know, Sean Tilger. These guys are all phenomenal. Peter Luco, who was you know Ed's right hand man, when we talked about went to Florida. Um, you know he's also um, you know he's he's just another just this is what makes the team what they are so that's that I, I uh, you know I appreciate you guys putting some time in I know there's a lot of other stuff to talk about today so let's get to that shall we but um, anyway thanks so much for listening um, all right let's talk about how the Flyers got into the playoffs because we're talk let's talk about these games on Saturday it's funny I was um. I'm down. I'm down in my basement working on stuff, getting you know, doing some doing some stuff around the house, watching these games at 12:30. It's snowing here in Philadelphia, and um, I had both the games on at the same time, and it was what a crazy beginning to both of these games. The Islanders, the Islanders. Um, it, I mean, not no. I'm sorry. The Red Wings. The Red Wings Rangers game. Let's talk about that first, Russ, because there's a lot of controversy around this. Okay, there's a lot of like, um, Elaine Vigneault, who I have always never really been a huge fan of. I give huge props for for what he does in this game. He there's a, there's a goal that's off sides, you know, and it's counted as a goal for the Red Wings. It gives the, it gives the Red Wings a one nothing lead. Vino can't really want to win this game, but he he does want to win this game, and he goes so you know. But all of the logic of us saying, oh, he doesn't want to play the playoffs. Penguins, I guess he, you know, he's like, we just want to win every game. Huge respect for Ellie, and huge respect also for the Rangers fans. I'm going to throw this out there too. The Rangers fans that were in attendance of that game, at least. I don't know, no, no, no. No, no, no. Wait a sec. I know. I Dan, was at but... the game. I, I was at the game. I can tell you what was being screamed in my section. Okay. Okay. Well, I just, all, all I can say is there was there was some big time, I, from what I could hear. Okay. So you we uh, so I'll retract that. You can tell us that story. But I think that uh, at least on on TV it sounded like they were really. I was watching the Rangers Rangers broadcast, you know, and um. They were the, the Rangers broadcasters were even like, well, they're really cheering for the Rangers to win this thing, and uh, and for Vino to like coaches challenge a goal and take it in, in that situation, that is that takes some kahunas, and I don't think any you know any Rangers fan can really hold that against them, you know. I mean, and I know people are. It was an amazing thing in the sense that it does show you that while we think that teams do want to tank occasionally and play certain opponents occasionally. They still want to win above everything else. Now, yeah. Dan can definitely say what happened in the crowd, but you're always going to have like of course. some bad guys doing that in a crowd. But I think at the end of the day, it, the fan base was probably split as to what they wanted to have happen, really. Yeah. Real quick, um, it was funny because there, there was a, a guy and girl sitting next to me, and they, they seem to be big Ranger fans on paper, and you get this sometimes, but they clearly have not been to a live sporting event in a few years. They were like a a stereotype of a uh, John Bon Jovi video pretty much and um, they didn't uh, they didn't understand that you could actually uh, you could actually review those plays 
because um, the guy was just screaming, what, what's going on? Why, are, why is the game stopped? <laughs> um, they didn't know who Dylan Larkin was. Um, yeah, it was just a bad, it was, but I was like letting all that go. I was quiet. I was censoring myself. I was, as I was twinging and he was telling me how he, he was telling his girlfriend how, you know, Jesper Foss is one of the best young players in the game and all this stuff. And I was twitch, I was twitching. And then finally a song came on and, um, and the was girl it was, living, like, on a, was it living on a prayer. No, no. The song came on. And the girl was like, what song is this? He's like, I don't know. I'm not really indie rock. And I screamed out loud. It's the, rhymes with ducking, it's the bleeping Beatles. <laughs> I said, I can tell. I go, I give you a pass on everything else that's come out of your mouth this period. But I call it BS on that. <laughs> that's fine. Oh, well, that's I, awesome. While we had those two games going on in tandem, um, it's funny because, uh, I had to step out early, but I'd say early second period when the Bruins in Boston were leading one nothing, and I came back and it was four one. It was just a complete and utter collapse by the Bruins, and I'm I'm pretty sure that Jonas Gustafsson, you know, immediately flew from Boston to Augusta to be the caddy for Jordan Spieth. It was in, that in uncomfortable. NFL. Seriously, it was. It was. I mean, I, I I couldn't. I could not believe because you know you had Chris Neal score the goal to tie at one one, and then the floodgates opened. And the thing was, you knew before this game that something was wrong because Tuka Rask comes out for the warm up, takes two shots, looks like he's about to pass out on the ice. He's like leaning on one knee. He takes a couple shots in in the crease and then leaves immediately for the uh, for the locker room, and they announced that Jeremy Smith, their backup goalie from Providence, had been called up on, a, on an emergency basis. So something was wrong, and just everything that could go wrong after the Pasternak goal went wrong for the Bruins, and now probably, we're probably going to hear, and I'm, I'm just guessing here, but the speculation is it's going to cost Claude Julien his job in the next few days. It is tough. I mean, look, the wheels fell off. I mean, it's funny because before the season began, I thought they'd be the worst team or one of the worst teams in the NHL, and they weren't. And then they, they struggled, and then they made moves. And I thought with the moves, they would limp into the playoffs, but clearly they didn't. And now they're back to me thinking they're one of the worst teams again because they've got a big problem moving forward. Like, that game is going to mm -hmm. stick with them for a while. And, yeah. you know, it's tough. I feel for the fans. I do. And this is two years in a row for them. But but for the debate that we had last week, I'm sorry. The Detroit Red Wings backed into the playoffs in a game where the Hartford Wolf Pack was playing at MSG, and they still lost. The only way they're going to win a series in this playoffs, and this you know it plays out because they're playing against Tampa Bay, is for Tampa Bay to lose you know three of their top players, and that might be the case with Stamkos out, with with Strawman out, and possibly Tyler Johnson uh, knocked out after uh, Greg Patteron from the Canadians slammed him into the boards. Is there any supplementary night. supplementary discipline on that? They 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 passed on it. They said no no discipline. Okay. You know, but look, I mean, you can go to that Flyers Penguins game, and Matt Murray was playing like an amazing game, then all of a sudden he gets bumped into, and his mask comes off, and Sure enough, he's probably got a concussion. He comes out. That certainly changed the complexion of that game too. Yeah. This is what happens this time of year. Players, I mean, yeah, things happen. There was a there was a definite the playoff race of those three teams definitely became a war of attrition. There's just no ways yeah. there's no ways about it. And and you know I think the team that was playing the worst over the last month is the team that didn't make the playoffs. I feel like that. I feel like the I feel, I feel like the two teams that should make the playoffs. You can say that no one played well right down the end, but when you go over the last month or so. Or last two months, the Flyers played pretty well, they and, did. and you know, and the Red Wings had their moments too, um, but the Bruins really, you know, from the from basically the trade deadline on, were terrible, um, and and they, you know, they really would have backed into the playoffs. The Red Wings, it wasn't from the trade deadline; it was from about mid, about St. Patrick's Day. They went through, I think, three six and one or three yeah. and seven yeah, in the yeah, last. Yeah, before the trade deadline, even too, but. And that, then they had a hard schedule. We talked about that too. They had a tough. They had they traveled a lot. They they and you know and I think with the in the Flyers case, as opposed to the Red Wings or the Bruins, I felt like the Flyers really just ran out of steam from having to play so many games. Yeah, um, they had to be perfect. They had to be perfect every night. It, it was obvious in that game against Pittsburgh the way it's uh, the way it started off. I mean, Murray had them shut out for a while. They were they didn't score the first goal. There was no energy. In that but, first period, those are all warning signs, but they got past it. 
But again, but again, Pittsburgh did not play Latang and they did not play Crosby. So the oh, there were like Ross. seven regulars that didn't play. Like I seven. Right. Didn't so, play Murray either. So self interest. When we come up to this next year, self interest, team self interest trumps rivalry. It doesn't right. matter if it's Philadelphia Pittsburgh. You're going to keep Latang and Crosby healthy for the playoffs. It doesn't matter if you hate the other team, if they're your biggest rival in the world. You're thinking about yourself when it comes down to the end. Well, of the maybe season. we shouldn't be playing 22 games per team in March either. You know, maybe we should play one more game in October, one more game in November, so teams are playing like 17 times and you know, it's NBC's fault. NBC it wants is. that. Because they won't show any games on the main channel for the first half of the season, and yep. they backload the schedule. This is what they do, and yeah. it definitely affects the sport. But that Islander game, that was like an all-star game without the all-stars in it. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, yeah no, what, well, yesterday's Islanders-Flyers game? No. Yeah. But what about... That was, what that about, was, that was crazy, but let's... let's um, yeah, I want to get to that, too, because that was... Um, but go ahead, Mike, you can go first. No, I was going to say, and also the same thing with the Anaheim-Washington game. That had, that had, you know, I mean, Washington earned the right to not have to play their players. Uh, Lebechkin got his 50th goal. I mean, if he hadn't scored... He had five people in between periods on the concourse. Alex Ovechkin walked through the concourse and high-fived fans. That is awesome. He's always going to be awesome. Yeah. So few players get it the way he does. I just had to but, say that. But I mean, but that had that had ramifications for the Anaheim Ducks because now the Anaheim Ducks are playing, I think, in, in a way, a more difficult uh, foe in the Nashville Predators. Who you know they have Pekka Rene, they have Shea Weber, they have Ryan Johansson up the middle. Whereas the uh, whereas the L.A. Kings get the the Northern California Patsies in the All right, wait a second. No, 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 no. <laughs> No. The Predators were plus 13 in goal differential this year. The San Jose Sharks were a plus 13. I'm just saying that to get under your skin, Eck. I'm sorry. And the Sharks are going to be a problem. Yes, they are. And they have question marks in goal. They're a little loose on defense in times. But up front, yeah. they, up front they might be better than the Kings. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. And the Kings I'm aren't playing great. No, I'm not going with that. No, no way. You wouldn't take know. right now. You wouldn't take Pavelski and Thornton o over what what the the uh, Kings have on their front their front line. No, I mean you're talking about. Look, I'm not the biggest fan, but when in the playoffs, Jeff Carter, Carter, Tyler Toffoli, they're gonna have Luchik beating up guys in the corner. Gabrick will wake up. I'm not. No, I'm not doing that. No. Kopitar, Kopitar and Carter Kopitar. as your one two up the middle, yeah, as yeah. opposed to Pavelski and Thornton. I'll take. Look, I, I, I talk to Kings. I like one of my friends, closest friends, is a Kings fan, and I he is not happy with the way this team is one Every Kings playoffs. fan's not happy. Yeah. They weren't happy the year they won the first cup. Right. Everybody was bitching. They all bitch. I'm just saying this isn't going to be a five-game win for the Kings. I, did, I didn't say it was going to be a five-game. I think the yeah, LA Kings no are going to win. I will tell you there is no way the Sharks are winning that series. That is my lock, and I don't even I, – I don't have a 1-800 number you can call either. Cookies, Zach. Cookies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, what do I know? I picked the Flames to win the division. <laughs> but now you <laughs> – They should have a carry around. Um, another chance. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that no, – <laughs> That was the most awesome. sought-after unrestricted free agent goaltender, Kari Ramo. Yes. He's in the Switzerland. They're lining up for him. Ah, no. Someone's going to pay him. Um, all right. So so this ends up like – this, end, and the playoff matchups, I think, I really – I like where they ended up. I think I think it's – I think Anaheim – I mean, Nashville actually plays better against the Kings than they do the Ducks. So that, that was really not a great thing for the Predators. Um, the Ducks are – that, that's going to be a great series that no one's going to talk about. You know, it's a crazy. I mean, that Anaheim-Nashville series is a hell of a series. I mean, it really is. I mean, the Ducks, you're looking at one we'll of the We'll never see it on TV, but it will be a great series. Yeah, I know. Here's, the play, here's the playoff wall, folks, right here. Right there's nice. the playoff wall. There you have nice. it. There's the matchups. Nice. And, uh, yeah, you know, so we're going to see the Ducks, and we're going to see I – mean, I mean, the Ducks' offense versus the Predators' defense is going to be fun to watch. I mean, that's going to be really, really fascinating cool. to Predators play a style that I really wanted to see the Predators against the Kings. I've wanted to see the Predators against the Kings every year because, and we might in the second round, but I think I think that what you see with the Predators just match up well. Of all the teams in the West, the Kings really are a good matchup against almost everyone except for the Ducks and the Predators. You know, those yeah, are the but here's the funny thing about the Kings. The Kings are a great matchup for everybody in the first round, and the minute they're out of the first round, you don't want to play them anymore. Right. My, see, my winner last year, the the winner for the dog series of the of the eight 
what was Calgary Vancouver. I think I don't think anybody other than people in Calgary and Vancouver watched that series. This year, I think the winner of that is probably Tampa Bay and Detroit because without without Stamkos, without Johnson, without Strawman, with a Detroit team that seems to be you know, not exactly spectacular with Datsuk on the verge of, you know, yeah. going back to the, the K to Russia and the KHL. I mean, this is not a marquee matchup. You could you could say Florida and the Islanders might contend for it, but I actually think that's a more interesting series because Florida, I think it's more interesting. I yeah, think. but but Tampa Bay, Detroit. I mean, the thing is, whoever wins that series, if if the Islanders beat Florida or Florida beats the Islanders, I think they're the favorite over Tampa or Detroit because those teams are just so injured. And so, I agree. Or, Tough to say with Tampa. I I think Tampa could surprise everybody a little bit. I mean, I know that without you know, Stamkos is obviously a huge factor, but if you remember Stamkos's role last year in the playoffs was not that big in the early rounds. As you get as you get later, it, I I can see that I can see Tampa. I mean, don't. But he I, was a physical presence, and he was pushing around guys on the ice. He was. Remember, he, he was. was well, he definitely was. And he and he, he he's always. I mean, and he could. Be back at some point, right? In the playoffs, is possible. They said one of those yeah. months. They're I think what playing. benefited them though was the balance they had because they had the yes. balance of the triplets, they had yeah. the balance of the Stamkos line. And their bottom six was chipping in big time, yeah. but now you have that separation because Johnson's out for we don't know how long. Yeah. Stamkos is out. Yeah. You right. hope Drewen could come in and really provide a spark, but the, and the Strawman injury, Strawman settled everything down on right. that blue line. Yeah. This is going to be on uh, this. Uh, I, you know. I know Ben Bishop's a big boy, but he's going to have a, a, a world on his shoulders. Yeah, yeah. Now, your num- now your number one center is Val- 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 Valtteri Filippola, and your number two center is probably Brian Boyle moved up. or they well, Right, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. That's a problem. And with that being said, I still think they can beat Detroit. Right. I mean, I, I'm not saying Detroit's a world beater, and they've got no. the, pro- the problems of their own. I mean, I, I've, I've watched them. problems, their defense is a little porous, and they don't that's, score enough. Datsuk is playing hurt. He definitely he looks like he's, he's he wounded. Is. He is, and and you know the 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 young guys who they thought were gonna start picking up the slack really didn't do it this year. So they're gonna and and they don't have the goaltending savior that Tampa Bay does. I mean Ben Bishop can, could carry a team through the series through a series, whereas Jimmy Howard he played well down the stretch, but he has. Yeah, a feel good about Jimmy. Gonna, I don't feel good about Jimmy Howard. In the yeah, not at all. Not at all. No, no I mean I, they're gonna go. I guess they're gonna go with Jimmy Howard, but yeah. Well, I would go with Mrazek. I really would. If I was them, I would go with Mrazek. See, this the thing about the the postseason is it is a new season, and it really is. There really is this feeling of, and the best thing about teams making the playoffs. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, in my opinion, I, I this was something a scout told me years ago. The best thing about, like for example, the Flyers making the playoffs is the fact that all those young players get almost another season under their belt. Right. It, it yeah. becomes it's it's like you're it's like you're playing another season before next season, and you get in there and you know it completely feels different and has a new feel to it, um, and you know all those rookies get a chance to actually, you know, just mature a little a lot faster by going through a playoff series. There's no question about it. Even yeah, if they get, I would like to add that I, I wrote something on Sportsology about the Hextall plan. Yeah, which, let's talk about that. That's really good. Which, if you remember last year when they didn't make the playoffs, a lot of guys on the radio and a lot of people were starting to like get nervously itchy about the Hextall plan, and Sam Hinkey was the golden boy, and Ron Hextall was like, we don't know what Ron Hextall is. And and I kept having to tell people, listen, this guy's plan is unwavering. You are not going to see it change at the trading deadline, and for two trading deadlines and everything else, it hasn't changed. They've made the playoffs, like you said, so now the young guys get playoff experience. He's gotten some young players to play in Lehigh, and now instead of being three or four years away, they're they're a lot closer. So yeah, I feel like they're almost a little ahead of schedule because when they're, they when, all the, when their defensemen mature, I think they're going to be a dynamite team. Well, yeah. let, let, let's let's talk about let's talk about some of the news here and just came Actually, out. I do right. a breaking news, Mike, and then I'll let you get to it. The breaking news is Henrik Lundqvist left the ice in practice. He went and talked to the equipment guy. He went back and then he left again. So he Uh-oh. didn't finish practice. So I don't know what that means, but I'm just Uh-oh. letting you know. And one thing before we get on to the other things as well, definitely check out Russ's article on Sportsology because it is really strong. And, and, it's, and it's one of the better perspectives that I don't think that many are getting. Are, are, you know, and it's not really being reported very much. And, you know, and you know, one of the big things about, you know, Ed Snyder was that he, he may have been letting this, like, rebuild happen is was was really was really tricky and really difficult because he, this is not this is not as we all know is not in his world to do this so and, making and the playoffs this year really meant a lot. And one thing I mildly disagree with with Russ and I talked to about talked to him about the uh, about this before the webcast is 
you know, he mentioned the the uh, the promise of pain from the Maple Leafs hierarchy before the season, and how the the the, uh, the Flyers did not go that direction, and it's benefited them, and you know, basically turning around quickly and making the playoffs. Well, they had Claude Giroux, they had uh, uh, some young prospects in the organization already. They had a Jakub Voracek, who's a very good player, and some other players. The Maple Leafs really didn't have that. The Maple Leafs had a core that needed to be destroyed, and they and they are doing that. And that's what is going to happen in Edmonton this summer. Is they are going to blow apart that a lot of that core group because they've just lost too long, and they have well, to change things over. You have to wait for that. See, wait, you have to wait for that ceremony. And is it over yet? Is the <laughs> ceremonial? I mean, I thought I think Arcabello and Jesse Uensu are coming out next. <laughs> uh, the only retort I have, Mike, is that. After last year, a lot of Flyers fans were ready to trade Claude Giroux, and they didn't like Steve Mason. That's a reality that yeah. there was a large segment of the fan base that questioned both those things. Now, let me just update a couple things that came over. the. Uh, first of all, Marc-Andre Fleury practiced with the Penguins to, uh, this morning, so maybe that's a signal that he'll get the start in Game 1 against the Rangers and not Matt Murray, who looked like he had his head taken off by Braden Shen. Uh, a lot of stuff coming out just now from Montreal. Mark Bergevin, to X delight has confirmed that Michel Therrien will be back next season, but he also has said, it is my quote, in quotes, my intention not to trade P.K. Subban. That doesn't mean he's not going to. He's, he's gone. It's my intention to not trade P.K. How Subban. How about the reporter that asked uh, Subban to give Pacioretty a hug if there were no hard feelings between the two? I that was good. Know. I saw that. That was really good. Come on. I, it's, I, all, it's all drama. That's it all. Is. I will bet any amount of money that P.K. Subban's not traded. There's he's no not going to be traded. I agree with you. There's they would be no stupid way. to trade either of them. Yeah, they're not going to trade. Uh, there's a better chance that Pacioretty would get traded but than, than P.K., but P.K. is not going to – neither is going to get traded. P.K. is definitely not going to get traded. I mean, he's by far the most popular player in that team, um, and by far, you know, he's, he's the voice of that team. I mean, his interview was – his interviews, you check them out on Sportsnet. They're really good. Um, I was looking at them earlier. They're just really – he he has some great answers to the questions and, and yeah you get you get he's one of the few players that you don't get a pre-programmed brainwashed answer to. It's so true, and he's 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 100 percent legit. And usually those guys get criticized. You know, it's like oh we we hate it when players are honest, and then when they are oh well this is terrible. I, I'll I'll just say this: if Montreal does trade PK Subban, they're stupid. Do I think that they could trade PK Subban? Yes. No. So that's an indication that that organization may be stupid. But I, if I, if I, I, I would not trade him. He is a linchpin number one defenseman. He's one of the top I'd say five to six defensemen in the league. And you don't trade guys like that. But it doesn't make sense that he would be. No, it, it, no, I totally disagree with that, Mike. And there's first of all, the Canadians are that's just crazy. They're not a stupid organization. I mean, I I joke about the Terrian thing all the time for sure, but this is not a stupid organization. Um, you know, and I don't, I don't understand the Terrian thing at all. But well, it seems like him and Bergevin are tied together. It seems like ownership has made that a thing now. That's what it seems like to me. Like, hey. Yeah. This is your guy. You hired him. It's your mess. You got to get out of it. I with think him. That is, I think that's very accurate. Um, but I do think that you know, the Canadians aren't. This is this is a this is a this is the Montreal Canadiens. This organization is not gonna. They they will make some good moves. They they will they will get better. They you know they did have a great start. The car losing Carey Price was devastating. I mean, there's a bunch of things that happened this year that you know you can't and there, but there is no way they're gonna move PK Subban. There's just well, no way. I mean, you can't get for any amount of money. There's, there's, you know, you couldn't get him for you know. There's there's like two or three players in the league. You know, we're talking like McDavid and Crosby. It, it would make no sense. It would make sense that they would hold on to him. I'm just saying that you know they have known for at least three years what they needed to do with that organization to make them more successful. They haven't done it. Kept, and they've kept putting it off. So can I rule? PK can I rule existing. out? PK is what they've done right. Well, no, no, no. What, what I'm what I'm saying is they did not go out and get the players that they needed to to add to the current core to to make them more competitive. I can't say that you know they're not going to do the wrong thing again and trade a guy that you should build your team around because they haven't proven that they can do the right thing. That's all I'm saying. I mean, if they if they keep him and they build around him. Great because he's one of the better defensemen in this league, but you still have to go out and get players to build around Subban, to build around Price, and maybe Pacioretty, and make that team competitive. And Bergevin has not done that for three years. 
Yeah. I don't think that's fair. I don't I don't I disagree with some of that. I do. I mean, I think this year he deserves to have criticism because getting Ben Scrivens wasn't an answer to your goalie going down and you knew what your goalie meant to the organization and they definitely let the season slip away. That is on Bergevin, no question. But he made a lot of other good pickups. He hasn't he hasn't signed one bad contract. He hasn't extended one bad contract. Salmon. Right. So well, I mean, that was a one year though, so that's not really no, no, it was a one year shot. Really that, that, that was a uh, that was spitting in the wind. Sometimes the wind changes did, direction. Did, didn't, didn't, right. didn't he didn't he sign the Markov contract? Yeah, he probably did, but Markov still played better than most of us thought he could for the last two years. Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm you know I'm, I think uh, to Mike's point is he did he, he has too many of the same players, small perimeter forwards, and he didn't good do a good job of. Of getting a, a first line center, I mean, you can argue all you want if Flakanich is that or not. I know Galchenyuk has had a better year this year, um, and he we looks like he's improving. Line center next year, like we don't I mean, know. The argument that I'm with Russ there, Galchenyuk is a first line center. The, the problem there is the coaching that they yeah, have. Yeah, that's the thing. I think he is too, but they don't. Hit, they, they don't trust him there. Yeah, no. right. they oh, oh, him a chance. This year they had the perfect opportunity to, and they did more, but they had the perfect opportunity this year to let Galchenyuk, you know. Earn his, earn his oats as a first-line center. And but then, all I'm saying is in two of the last three seasons, when Carey Price goes down, their season is over with. The, the, the first time was in the, in the conference final against the Rangers when when him and uh, Kreider uh, uh, made yeah. contact with each other. Uh, this time it happened in November. When you, know, when you lose a guy like that, you have to be good enough at your other areas to be able to compensate. It's tough to say that, well, he's the, one of the best players in the game, you know, it's expected that you're going to be bad, but they should be at least a 500 team without Carey Price. And they, what, what was the record? 400, 375. Yeah, something like that. No, I mean that's. I think all that's fair, but I don't. I don't know the place that on Bergevin totally. Uh, I don't. I don't know. It's um. Well, if not him, who? He's the general manager. He's been in. No, control. I know, but I, I mean, I don't there's some criticism. No, there's some. I mean, he deserves some of it for sure, but. You know, like Russ said, I mean, there's some things there he didn't he didn't address the right ways, or he thought he had more confidence in his team than maybe he should have. But there's no question about that. But I think that at the end of the day, you also have a you also have a coach who's not coaching the system that to those players to the players he has. I mean, he's trying yeah. he's trying to make the players play a system that they can't play. That's and and I think that the the skill on that team is not. I mean, this feels a lot like Toronto in a lot of ways in the past, where Toronto has had players that weren't right for the system that they were trying to force down them. This, I mean, this Montreal thing feels like that to me. It has the same kind of feel to it. Um, they do have players with some creativity, and I feel like they're constricted because of their coaching. Yeah, yeah. But I'll tell you, their, their drafts have been pretty good. And they have been. The drafts have been good. The only one who's not producing is Della Rose, but, you know, they've got Noah Juleson last year. they got Simone Bork, who I think is a really good offensive defenseman last year. Those guys are a couple years away. They're in that in-between area again, so they do have to make an upgrade via free agency, no doubt. But I think, again, I think – they have a good future. They have a good future, the Canadians, where there's been a time when they haven't had any future. But, right. Russ, the, th the thing is, and last last point on the Canadians for me, is the, is the fact that you have Price, Subban, and Pacioretty all in their prime right now. The goal should be to get good now, while the while they're under all under contract. I think Price has two more years on his contract. Maybe, you know, I don't th think that there's any kind of great – fear that he's going to go someplace else. But I'm saying while they're in their prime, while they can play big minutes, while they can be impact players, you have to build your team to, to be able to win now with those guys. And they're not even close to that. But, so. No, that's um, fair. I mean, let's talk about, um, um, let's get into Don Maloney for a second here. Um, so Maloney has been relieved of his duties. I love when they say that, relieved of his duties. Um, and um, we, should all, we should all be relieved of our duties. Um in in Phoenix or Arizona or whatever you're going to call them, I, I think the Coyotes are nuts here. I want to say that right off the bat. I think that I think this is a bizarre move. Um, it's the strangest move because because of what has gone on. Like historically, there must have been a major shift in something because I mean this is a team that Maloney is not like necessarily the most patient guy in the world, and yet has been incredibly patient in with bringing his team along. You know, he's, he's, he's let guys develop and he's let guys mature. You know, it took Domi a long time to get here. He's got other players that are still that are great players that aren't there yet. Well, okay. Um, that that I, I, don't, I think this is a nuts decision. I don't understand if they if they weren't in line with what Maloney was doing, mm -hmm. and and he, and this team has managed to stay competitive mainly because Maloney's made some unbelievable moves over the years to just keep them competitive. I mean, this team was even competitive this year. 
Well, I mean, Russ can attest to the quality of the Arizona Coyotes of, of you know depth in their in prospects because they they have a lot of good young players coming. From what I from what I understand from the reports out there, it's sort of a power struggle where uh, he's he lost out. Now Tippett is going to have some more some more control over. Uh, player decisions, they're going to bring in a GM from the outside, they're going in a more analytical direction, but you can't really complain from the Coyotes' point of view what Don Maloney did, and he was under severe limitations. I mean, with, with guys like Domi, you know, they probably didn't call him up because it would have cost them too much. You know, they would right. have had to pay him $925,000. So, you know, they let their players overcook in the minors and in, in junior, and that's going to benefit them down the road. But I don't know if Domi overcooked. He went back to juniors for one year. He, no, he, well, he stayed until he was. He stayed through his nineteen-year-old year. Yeah, lot, so it was what, he players. was. He was in the league one, two years after his draft year. Yeah, which is I, unusual. I don't think that's that's I don't, I don't know. Let's just let's just think about this. The only failure that I can come up with with Maloney's concern is is Mark Visitin, the goalie. He he was looked at as possible number one goalie of the future and didn't make it. But Domingue really wasn't looked at as anything, and he turned into something. But yeah. I mean, they had Dylan Strom coming. They got Nick Merkley. I mean. Christian Dvorak, Ryan McKinnis is, is, is a potential star. I mean, yes. he is an absolute potential star. They have, you know, Dyson Mayo is a kid who I liked from Edmonton a couple of years ago. Henrik Samuelson, they've got players. They really do. Connor Murphy, they stuck with Connor Murphy. He's a kid who they drafted high. He got all kinds of injuries, and Gordon last Murphy. year started to carry his way through. And, you know, Maloney is a keen talent evaluator besides being a GM. He's one of the few that actually goes out there and does that. And I think he will get a job instantly. And the fact that they pushed him out the door, big mistake. Yeah, me too. I mean, he went he he went through a lot with this organization, and he yeah. stuck, he stuck to the guns when this organization knew, knew, didn't know where they were going to play the next year. weren't they in the conference finals like three years ago? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's and and I'm not a big. I mean, I think Dave Tippett is a miracle worker. You know, and, yes, he and, is. And he, you know, he he coaches quite often the island of misfit toys. I always jokingly say, you know, where people find their way. Um, in with Dave Tippett, but I'm not that you know. Miracle Worker doesn't mean GM, you know. Like he's a coach. It, let's not. Well, uh, yeah. He could be a GM, but I think well, I think the combination they had there in Arizona was really strong. I thought that they the, the combination of Maloney and Tippett was really solid. I think Maloney will get a job immediately as well. You know, I wouldn't be too surprised if he even ends up somehow in the Rangers organization again. Um, but I'm they, not I the best person to ask about the Maloney family, by the way. I, I, I got to tell you something. I've spoken to him, and and he is as down to earth as it gets. Oh, I know. He's such a good hockey guy, and he'll have a long conversation with you about just about anything if you approach him. Yeah. I've, I've approached him at practices and spoken to him, and he was just a joy to talk to. And look, I get it. I grew up a Ranger fan, but I'm just saying, as a GM, sometimes things change with guys, and it never did. You know what? I, I'm sure in the movie this will this will be part of the John Scott factor. They'll be like Don Maloney. Traded John Scott and now he lost his job. <laughs> oh God, help us there. Um, but Maloney, yeah, no, he's he is the one of the classiest and one of the nicest people you'll ever deal with. I mean, he is, and you know, and and honest to a fault, like to an unbelievable yeah. fault. Like he just complete, he'll be completely honest about a player with you. I mean, he admitted he tanked last year. Yeah, yeah. I was just about, I was just about to bring that up. Do you, do you think that 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 admission has anything to do with this? No, no, no. I, I think. I think anybody who was in the bottom ten last year wished their general manager sure. would say that. Uh, how many when Devil fans? Uh, how many play, Devil fans wish that? Yeah, when you watch Dylan Strome play, I'm sure Devils fans would have gone that route in a second. Mm -hmm. Although, although Russ watching Pavel Zaka in his NHL debut looked pretty darn good. Oh no, he's a heck of a player, man. Oh yeah, he, it's not a knock on Pavel Zaka. It's just no. a chance. Last year you had a chance to get into the top two. You, you got to try and do it. Right. I love Pavel Zaka. I really. It's funny because a couple of years ago. There were people who weren't that high in him because they used the, well, he doesn't play the complete game thing. But what yeah. he does do, he's really good at, and he's going to be a dominant player someday. Now, the yeah. other the other management change was uh, Brian Murray getting kicked up into an advisory role and Pierre Dorian Jr. being named the general manager of the Senators. Um, a good move I, by the Senators. I mean, and not not unexpected. I mean, no, but but the, there's probably going to be more changes because it sounds like Cameron's going to lose his job. Uh, I mean, it's not a guarantee, but they haven't made the move yet. But that's it's in the wind that Cameron is going to be one of the casualties, and um, Claude Julian may lose his job in Boston. 
And Claude Julian, I believe, is from Ottawa, so you, there might be there. You know, that could be a fit if Julian gets fired with the Bruins. He could end up. He could end up with the Senators. Well, I think I think any coaching vacancy in Claude Julian is probably a good fit. We all know this what this is. Why is. I don't understand Michelle Terrian. I'm just throw that out there right now. But, yeah, I mean that's well, fair. To say. This is the perfect. This is. The, I mean, there's no. I mean, he played for the Canadians, right? He, he's um. Yeah, but they're not. The floor. He's just. He's part. He's, he's the French-speaking. Incredible. I mean, you could. You have the chance. You never get a coach like this. You never get a French-speaking coach of this caliber available. Um, and but, Montreal but, is missing. But, but, yeah. They've they've gone down the road of bringing Terrian back for a second time. You're going to fire him and bring back Julian for a second time. Well, who's next? They're going to bring back uh, Randy Honeyworth. I mean, I would much rather bring back Julian for a second time than Terrian for a second. Well, I, I I I get that point of view, but gee, you know, that, I think that if if Montreal was going to fire Terrian, they were probably going to go in a completely different direction, maybe a Guy Boucher or something of that nature. But they're you know they're going to stick with with Terrian. I could I could speak to Ottawa because I watch Cameron coach in juniors and I think Cameron's a pretty good coach. I don't really think he deserves to be fired, but they're going to do it because they're going to want to start a new and and that's fine. Pierre Dorian, I've had him on my show for XM maybe two or three times. This guy is a tremendous talent evaluator. You go look at the Ottawa picks that have happened in the last three yeah, drafts. Look, look at their last look at their last couple of drafts. They've yeah. been tremendous, and this guy literally. Always took time for us. He's always out there. Like he's one of those assistant GMs that was out there looking at guys every game. We would he would come on our show and literally be stepping out of the rink to talk to us and then going back in the rink. So he's a very hard worker, very yeah. smart guy. So I, I'm really excited. It looks like Lundqvist has the flu. That's what the word is. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want a dark horse for the Ottawa job if Cameron is fired is Luke Richardson. Um, he's been yeah. he's been down with Binghamton for a few years. I know that he was in the mix for the Buffalo job before they went towards Babcock and then Bilesma. Um, but Richardson's been pay paying his dues, and I know one of the considerations with him was his daughter was in college, family yes. family situation. I think she graduated this she graduates this year, so he'd be freed up to you know, if he if he does get an NHL job to take the job. So that, I think that's a distinct possibility. And he won a championship in Binghamton. He's a really good coach. He does yeah. deserve a chance. Yes. Yeah. He'd be a good one. He would definitely be a good one. I also think Guy Boucher is going to get back in the NHL soon. Yeah, sure. I yeah. think he should. Um, and I think that I and I think I my prediction is Guy Boucher will get back in the NHL and and kick butt in the NHL. I just I just have because I, I just having talked to people around him, he has learned exactly what he needed to learn. Like you know, like it's one of those things that he he made some mistakes. He was always a, considered a very good coach, but then he made some NHL making mistakes, and then but going over seas um, and coaching over there, I've heard that you know his attitude is totally different, and he's learned the key things that he was missing. And when he comes back, he could be he could be a problem. He could be a problem. I mean, he could, he could really. He would. I also think he'd bring a really interesting um, system to the NHL, which I would like to see. Like he's definitely he is more of a run and gun type coach, which would be fun to watch. Um, we I need that coaching dark horse, somebody who just recently lost his job, had always been rumored to go to the NHL. Uh, Mike Eames, the Wisconsin coach. Yeah. This is a guy that could walk into a team and have the same kind of results that Dave Hackstall did, and. I would expect somebody to hire Mike Eves in this offseason. If there's an if there's an availability, he's going to get interviewed. I'm pretty sure. Well, I well, think Axel's success though is is going to open the door for a lot of college coaches. I think that yep. that is something. I mean, really, it is going to play into it. I mean, Hextall is considered. Um, he you know he's getting coach of the year mentions and stuff like that now. I I, I don't think that Bob Hartley is going to get fired in Calgary. I think they're going to give him give him next year. But if if he if if he does go like in the middle of next year. Mark Crawford could be a, a, a candidate in Calgary. Uh -huh. he, he, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, he, it, it could very, it, it could very well happen. He's now, you know, he, he he's out of Switzerland. He's back in North America, and him Burke hired him in Vancouver, and Burke almost hired him instead of Carlisle in Toronto. So. Yeah, you know, I'm sure I'm sure Tra Living would have some input in that. Obviously, being the general manager, but I wouldn't be surprised if Hartley got fired. That Crawford would be in the mix. I don't know if Brian Burke would go to Crawford. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Yeah, I would, it's a possibility. I could see Boucher being a better fit there. Um, but he, Eve's actually played for Calgary, just for the record. Yes, he no, he did. He was definitely a Calgary. So player. there's there's something there, and then Eve's was also drafted by the Blues, so there may be something there. 
Now, this is the one I don't understand, Russ, is the fact that there is talk, and it doesn't seem like they're going to be acting upon it, but there is talk that Willie Desjardins is in trouble in Vancouver. And I know that Vancouver was a disaster this year, but they didn't expect, and not many people expected them to make the playoffs last year, and he got them to the playoffs. I mean, I think he's a good coach. It's just it was a mess there this year. And that's an itchy market. That is a very itchy market, though. And because they're the only team in that market, they go under tremendous scrutiny, right or wrong. And so I'm not going to say I would be asking for his head, but it wouldn't shock me if it happens because. There's just – it's I don't know what the expectations were, honestly. There's, I thought early in the year they had a chance to make it, but they weren't expected to, and they're going to get a decent pick again, and they have a good young core. Like, yeah. the team's aging. There's nothing they can do about that. Right. Nothing. The lack of success there has created, like, an insecurity slash lack of patience, and yes. they just – I think they were way too reactionary there. You know, I think they got some good young players in place, McCann and Vertanen. And right. look, Ryan Miller can't stay healthy now. When Miller was healthy at the beginning of the year, they were above water. Yeah. So I think yeah. I de- definitely think they're going in the right direction. It's just you need Dan, to – Dan, what's the percentage of Capuano losing his job if they lose in the first round? Uh, I would say uh, I would say 80-20. But, I would go 95-5. But there's nothing that this organization has done. You know, it would have to be the new owners you know, saying enough is enough. Because yep. if it, Wong still has a voice, and I, I, I don't see him going, I think they'll use a crutch of injuries, but they're starting to get healthy. Hamannick will be playing in game one. so If they were to lose in seven, I think they're, then it would be like 80-20. If they lose in four or five, I think he gets fired. I agree. And look, as critical as I've been of him, the team has responded since he's called them out. Uh, they yes. finished the season strong. Uh, eight, three, and one, I believe, is how they finished the season. Yeah. And he, I think, he's finally found the right line combinations because Tavares, Nielsen, and Aposto together have looked outstanding. And moving Strom and Nelson back to their natural positions of center, they're getting something out of them now too. So I will hey, have Pollock to. Get, I have, good yesterday. What's that? <laughs> Pollock looked good yesterday, but he won't uh, get. Yeah, keeping him in the lineup is a good thing, right? Because he's he's been good. He does yeah, not look like put him in the lineup. It's a if, shame, but they, 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 if Mark Stripe plays over him uh, in Game One, seriously, like Pulak okay. has done nothing to merit coming out of the lineup. I know. And, if it, okay, it, it, I, I'm pretty sure that Ken Hitchcock was a bit irked that the Blues lost to Washington on Saturday because that puts him right into that St. Louis Chicago matchup which I'm sure he was trying to avoid and Dallas with you know, Tyler Sagan is practicing this morning so he may be back for for at points during this uh, series against the the Wild. I mean, I, I would think that St. Louis would have rather played Minnesota even though they lost to Minnesota last year. Oh yeah. Well, as I always say, hitches be crazy. Um all right. Let's go to the NHL Lottery Simulator. Yes. When is the draft lottery? Because that's going to be April 30th. April 30th. April 30th. I hope and I'm not like the, the Toronto Maple Leafs would like to thank everyone for their support as they finish in 30th place. I there's, something, there's something we haven't talked about about the lottery. There's a, there's a new thing besides the ping pong balls when the first four picks come out. After that, there is a best of three situation that they go through for like four through 15 or five through 15 where – the percentage of that then helps you for the next pick. So there's it, – it's changed. Like after the – I think it's – I want to say it's top four. It changes after the fifth pick, but I'll find out. We should out. do a yeah, show after that lottery because, you know, you know the, this is going to be a, one of the most uh, highly rated shows in Canada. Oh, yeah, this is all Canadian. Um, all right, here we go. Picking the winner today. Columbus. That's right, I believe. Oh! <laughs> And the Calgary Flames. There you have it, Home Canada. You sure do draft high. Um, hey, look, as I, it I, I, be. Edmonton at fourth. Thank you. Edmonton at fourth. Right. Yeah, they, they, could take, they could take Chikrin. It's true. That's very true. I almost stopped the broadcast there accidentally. I didn't. Um, okay, so, yep. <laughs> yeah, because he wants to He wants to avoid the, the specter of the Toronto Maple Leafs winning the draft lottery. Oh, God. Edmonton, Edmonton needs their hands tied. They need to put a draft in a spot where they have to take a defenseman. No, the, the, no Edmonton needs, to have their, hands, <laughs> needs to, their hands tied and to be shoved off a bridge. They need, oh. you know, they need, they need what this, like, what the NBA did with the 76ers, like, to bring somebody else in completely. We don't trust do, you anymore. Do you think the, um, the, the Rexall place uh, ceremony will be done by the draft lottery, or everybody's just going to stay there and just watch the draft lottery? 
We've talked about this one, yeah. You have to retire that joke, Dan. Somewhere uh, in the city of Edmonton, like, Gilbert Brule is, like, looking for his invitation. <laughs> oh, oh, Sam Gagne is uh, running down with the, the torch or whatever. Ma- Martin, Marinson, uh, Martin Marinson asked to be uh, scratched for the last game against New Jersey because he wanted to fly back to Edmonton for the ceremony. Remember, without the buzz, it's just hockey. <laughs> we will talk to you tomorrow. We'll, be, uh, we'll start our previews then, guys.